Okay. Well, we're going to see if we can pick up where we left off in the last hour. Our study, Changing Times, we continue studying that concept. Changing Minds for Changing Times, as we saw in our first class uh, this morning. Reminding you again of what <coughs> Solomon had written in Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as man thinks within himself, that's what he really is. So he is. And so therefore, God has made it possible for us to be thinking the right thing on the inside. And we saw 1 Corinthians 2.16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? Answer, no one. No one gives instructions to God. However, the good news is, but we have the mind or the thinking of Christ. So therefore, if that's true, and it is, then as Paul says in Philippians 2.5, have this attitude, have this thinking, in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. What a marvelous provision God has made for us. I remember that our mission emphasis for July is uh, the Grace Evangelistic Ministries. And our classes, of course, coming up this coming week will be as usual. Prayer meeting Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock. Wednesday night class, 7.30. And, of course, Sunday and 9.30 and 11 o'clock. Pee Wee Camp starts Tuesday at 9 o'clock through, uh, it'll be Tuesday through Friday. And so we'll be meeting from 9 o'clock to about 12.30 with the kids. By the way, for those of you who will be interested in working in the camp, uh, we want to meet for just a few moments in the conference room uh, right after this class, just to touch base, make sure we got everything lined up and uh, getting ready for Tuesday morning. So if you're going to be involved in the camp, please stop in for a few moments after this class at the conference room. All right. <clears throat> Go ahead and check your phones if you would, please. Make sure they're in the silent mode. And we will follow our customary procedure, spending a few moments in silent prayer, and utilize this time, of course, to make sure that we are in fellowship. God, God the Holy Spirit's ministry is not quenched. We've not grieved him through unconfessed sin. And so therefore, we'll spend a few moments in silent prayer. You can exercise the privacy of your priesthood, acknowledging your sin silently and privately to God if necessary or taking any measure necessary for you to concentrate on the teaching of the Word of God. All right, so with this in mind, let us pray. Thank you again, Father, for this privilege we have of studying your word, fellowshipping with you through it. And it is our prayer that God the Holy Spirit will be able to take this information, make it real and make it meaningful to us, make it challenging for us in connection with our spiritual life, so that as we learn these things, we may apply them, they may become effective in our own lives, and of course making an impact for our Lord Jesus Christ. This we ask now as we give thanks in Christ's name, Amen. All right, in this particular section where we're studying, we're dealing in Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> beginning at verse 17 through 19, dealing with the mataotes mind. In contrast to that, we've run across in verses 20 through 24, the renewed mind or the renovated mind. And so we are looking at six aspects of the renewed mind from Ephesians 4, 20 through 25. The means of this renewed mind is in verses 20 and 21. The substance also in verses 20 and 21. The strength in verse 22. The mechanics in verse 23. The victory in verse 24. And in now in verse 25. Let's see if I can't get down there to verse. We wound up last time. <clears throat> 
in our study in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, it's where we're studying. Let me get over there in my notes where we left off last hour. All right, we were dealing with the concept of the likeness of God being restored. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> it says in Ephesians 4.24, And put on the new self. Now, this is the victory that has been given to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Putting on the new life. This is the spiritual life that you received at the moment of salvation. And so the victory of the renewed mind is the, the ability to be able to put on the new self, the new man. Which, of course, it goes on to say, which, is, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. This introduced us to the concept that man has, uh, God has been able to restore man both to the likeness of God and to the image of God. As a matter of fact, he did this at the moment of salvation when he uh, identified us with the Lord Jesus Christ. He positionally made it possible for us to be complete before him. Everything that he has accomplished for us has been in accordance with his righteousness and his holiness. He has not compromised his integrity in one way whatsoever. And so therefore we wound up looking at the fact that God restored man to the likeness to or to his image and to his likeness. We went back to Genesis and took a look at the episode of the creation of man in the image of God and then the likeness of God. Man lost that image, marred the likeness of God, had to be restored through spiritual birth. And so man now is born in the likeness of Adam and born in the image of Adam, physically alive, spiritually dead. So we wound up with that concept uh, last hour. We saw three things that has been given to us in bringing to us the victory of a renewed mind. First of all, believers can now put off that old man. We have the ability to live outside of the control of the old sin nature, as we saw. They can, we can put off the old man. Then the fact that our minds can be re, uh, renewed or renovated by the breathing of our mind or the inhale and the exhale of doctrine. And thirdly, the fact that believers can put on the new man the unique spiritual life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now all of this, down through verse 24, has led up for us to have a basis for the dynamics of a renewed mind. And it is the dynamics of the renewed mind where we start at this hour. All right, so finally, verse 25, the dynamics. Here it is. Here's what Paul says. Here's the conclusion. Therefore, based on what we have seen so far, in this part of, of chapter 4 of Ephesians, chapter 4, beginning at verse 17. Therefore, here's our conclusion. Laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, to his neighbor, for we are members one of another. All right, so here Paul starts with the concept of laying aside the lie. As a matter of fact, laying aside is the Greek word apotithemi. Again, we, we've had it several times. It means to cast aside or to cast off. The word falsehood actually is ho uh, sudas, the lying, we would say. Cast aside the lie or the lying. Cast aside the lie or the lying. And opt for what? Communicating the truth. Laleo, alithia means to communicate the truth. Speaking or keep on communicating the truth. There's a present tense here. So you keep on speaking the truth. Now, they too had been deceived with the lie and were told to put it off or to abandon it. It's what Paul is telling them. The truth is in Jesus. We saw that in verse 21. So lay aside the lie that Satan would bring about and pick up the truth. What is the falsehood, by the way? What is the lie? What is this lying uh, that was going around during that day? Answer, anything 
in any way that takes away from the Word of God and what it teaches about Jesus Christ. Answer again, what is the falsehood? What is the lying? Anything that in any way takes away from the Word of God and what it teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it relates, first of all, to Him being the Creator God. A lot of people are still confused. A lot of believers are confused about the Creator God. And the fact that the second person of the Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ, known to us as the Son of God, is the Creator God. Very beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know then that there are several passages that teach to us the fact that the very one doing the creating was the Lord Jesus himself, the second person of the Godhead. And so anything that takes away from that is a lie because in him everything was created, through him everything was created, for him everything was created. The Word of God is clear and crystal as that. In uh, the, fir- the Gospel, the first chapter of God, the Gospel of John, uh, the first chapter of Colossians, the first chapter of Hebrews, all three of those chapters relate to Jesus Christ as being the Creator. So if you've missed it, you can read through those uh, three chapters and see if you can't discover it. So anything that relates to Him or takes away from Him, <coughs> excuse me, that takes away from Him being the Creator God is a lie from Satan. Or anything that takes away from him being the revealed person of the Godhead in the Old Testament. Who was the God of Israel? Who was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Who was the angel of Jehovah that appeared to Abraham? Who is it that appeared to Moses? Who is it that appears uh, in a theophany in the Old Testament? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father is never revealed to man in the Old Testament in any physical manner whatsoever. This is good to understand and to realize. And so that began in the garden all the way through. All right, so anything that takes away from the person of our Lord Jesus Christ being the revealed person of Godhead from the very beginning is a lie because Satan wants to take away from that. He doesn't want Jesus Christ to receive the honor and the glory and the position that he actually holds. He'll do anything and everything to tear our Lord's position down. Why? Because he wants to take that position. That's the position he wants to have himself. He wants to be the one honored as uh, the God to be worshipped. The one who is Lord over heaven and earth. That's what Satan wants. Those positions, of course, belong to our Lord Jesus Christ. So he'll do anything and everything to take away from the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ is the revealed person of the Godhead in the Old Testament. Or the fact that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Anything that would take away from that, certainly Satan would, uh, would sponsor. This, of course, is the problem that the Pharisees had, the Sadducees. As you read through the Gospels, what's the problem? They will not accept him as who he actually is. They resent his position. They don't want him. Why? Because they believe the lie. They are of their father, the devil. He is the father of lies, and he is a murderer from the very beginning. And so, therefore, he will do anything and everything to strip our Lord Jesus Christ and to rob him of the position that he actually holds. All right, so, or anything that takes away from him as being the promised Messiah. Satan wants to be accepted as the promised Messiah. He wants to be uh, accepted as the promised one who would bring in for man a utopia, which of course he can't do, but that's his whole deal, so that he can be worshipped both by man and by the angels. So anything that takes away from our Lord Jesus Christ as being the promised Messiah, anything that takes away from him being the king of Israel, anything that takes away from him from being the greater son of David to sit on the millennial throne, any of these things that Satan sponsors, anything that would distract from him 
as the God-man in hypostatic union. This was the great challenge in the first century. Satan's greatest lie was, of course, to try to strip away the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so, therefore, he did anything and everything in the first century to tear that down and to destroy that doctrine. And so when you study the New Testament, oh, you see all of these groups, uh, such as the Essenes, uh, the groups of the uh, Nicolaitans, uh, you had the Gnostics, all of these groups were groups that uh, would attack the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, trying to tear him down as far as the truth of who he actually is. So anything that would take away from our Lord Jesus Christ as being the God-man, undiminished deity and true humanity in one person and that forever is part of the lie. Or anything that would take away from his birth, his virgin, the, vir the virgin pregnancy and the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many times in history has that been under attack? And how is it under attack today? Satan wants to destroy that concept. He doesn't want that to become popular or accepted. And he'll do anything and everything to deceive and to uh, cause deception to override the truth. He'll, he, of course, pulls out all the stops. And anything related that would take away from, uh, of course, his, uh, his life and his ministry while he was here. Thirty-three and a half years was his life. Three and a half years of ministry as he presented himself to the nation of Israel as the king of the world, or the king, their Messiah, their Messiah king, and also the redeemer of mankind. And so Satan does anything and everything that he can do to attack the birth and the life and the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And his substitutionary work on the cross, Satan attacks that every day. All the way from the fact that it isn't true, all the way to the fact that you have to add something to it. Whichever one you embrace, you're embracing the lie. If you embrace, of course, the concept that it wasn't true, that Jesus didn't die for the sins of the world, or that there's some other way of getting to heaven, then you've accepted the lie. Or if you accept the concept that you got to believe in Jesus but live a good life, you've accepted the lie. Or that once you become a believer, now you've got to uh, live under his lordship. He's got to be your lord. If he's not functioning as the lord of your life, then he's not lord at all, or some kind of nonsense. Anything to distract and to take away from the truth. That's what Satan promotes. He's been promoting it a long time. He continues to promote it. Anything that takes away from his work on the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection. In the book of Acts, what was the major story or the major doctrinal point that they made wherever they went? It was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that he died for our sins and he was buried and on the third day he arose from the dead. Because you see, Satan was always attacking and still is. Seeking to deceive and fill the world with deceit concerning the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or his ascension and session to the right hand of God the Father. And his future promises. Where is the promise of his coming? Satan attacks all of that. The future promises of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to take the bride, to take the church first of all, at the rapture of the church. And then of course at the second advent, to come and establish the kingdom on the earth from Jerusalem, reigning from Jerusalem, there in the nation of Israel. That's where he's going to set up headquarters. And so therefore Satan attacks any and all of the prophecies related to the promises that are yet future. Oh, he's a busy character. <laughs> but that's okay. He is pretty smart. And uh, he can handle it pretty well. As a matter of fact, you and I are seeing that right now in the time in which we live. All right, so keep on speaking the truth. Because we saw in verse 20 and 21, the truth is in Jesus. It can't be found anywhere else. And Satan says, no, I've got a substitute. 
I've got a counterfeit for you. I'm going to masquerade as the servants and the apostles of righteousness and the apostles of light. I'm going to take just enough of the truth to deceive you so that you'll swallow it, swallow the lie. All right, let's hear from our passage in Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 24. Let's hear the dynamics now of this renewed mind. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, keep on speaking truth each one of you with his neighbor, because we are members one of another. We belong to one body. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are one with him. And then he goes on in verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear it. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. That's the dynamics of a renewed mind. Now, as we read through, I'm sure you marked them all, <clears throat> 11 imperatives found in this passage I just read you. The do's and the don'ts of the renewed mind. Some people say, I just, want, I just want to know the do's and the don'ts, okay? Well, here's a little passage for you. The do's and the don'ts. About 11 of them. First of all, first do, do lay aside the lie. Verse 25. Lay it aside. If it is not compatible with the Word of God, if it doesn't, is not compatible with the grace of God, if it isn't compatible with the things that I just named over for you in connection with the person of Christ, what do you do? <laughs> you strip it away. You lay it aside. Lay aside the falsehood. Lay aside the lie. Next thing you do, speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Communicate those things that relate to Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is everything. He must have preeminence in every aspect and phase of life. Then he says, do be angry in regard to rejection and resistance of the lie. False doctrine. Some people refer to this as righteous indignation. Whatever it is, it means that you reject the lie. You hate the lie because the lie attacks Christ. And so therefore, you have this uh, orge, you have this righteous indignation against what is false, that which attacks our Lord Jesus Christ. However, in the same passage, he says, don't sin, however. Don't get involved in subjective anger. Parogismos is the word that is translated there. Uh, In the first, be angry, is the word orge, O-R-G-E. Then he goes and says, don't let that turn over into something that is subjective anger. Don't become personally involved. Paragismos. Don't sin. We've gone through this passage. We're not going to go through it, the details right now. Another don't. Don't give the devil a place or an opportunity. Don't give the devil a place or an opportunity. That's a tall order. That's a very tall order. Because there's so many things that reflect in our lives that are to reflect the character of Christ and reflect the principles of the Word of God. Sometimes our demeanor, our character, our, sp- our uh, speech, 
uh, a lot of things in life we have to be careful of as believers because we're here not to represent ourselves. We're here to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must be careful not to operate outside of the will and the purpose and the plan of God. We don't ever want to do anything that compromises the integrity of God in our own life. And so therefore, don't give the devil a place or an opportunity by getting sucked into aspects of the lie. Uh, don't steal. That's another don't. Paganism promotes immorality, lack of integrity. Don't steal. This is related to uh, a lack of integrity in action in order to obtain selfish desires. That's the idea. It's self at the center. Getting what you want outside of the concept of integrity. It can take on a lot of, a lot of faces, by the way, a lot of different areas of life. So it runs the gamut. See, paganism promotes immorality. Paganism promotes lack of integrity. Action in your life in order to obtain your own selfish desires and your selfish needs, whatever it takes. Do work. <laughs> Maybe we ought to put that up on a billboard all across our country. Go to work. Paul told the Thessalonian believers, the one don't work, they don't eat. You've got to work in order to eat, he says. Fulfill your responsibility. Fulfill integrity. We have a, an epidemic that's worse than the COVID-19 going on in Cloud Nation America today. It's the entitlement generation. It's destroying our economy. Being fueled, of course, by the, by the stupidity of our political leaders. Do work, he says. Then he says, number eight, don't speak unwholesome words. What's an unwholesome word? As far as God is concerned, unho unwholesome word is part of the lie. It's human viewpoint. It's part of the matayotes mind. It's part of futility, emptiness. That's what an unwholesome word is. When you give someone some human viewpoint as to how to solve a problem, such as maybe getting back at someone or not fulfilling a responsibility or obligation, that's unwholesome words because it plays into Satan's hands. That gives him an opportunity. Unwholesome words mean human viewpoint, human opinions, human ideas. And again, it takes on many faces. It comes across in many different ways, many aspects of it. But just generally, basically, it's the human perspective and human viewpoint, human rationale of life becomes very unwholesome for you as a Christian because it is the unwholesome words, part of the dragon lingo that we embrace that allows us or makes us work outside of the boundaries of the plan of God and the will and the purpose of God and the integrity of God. So don't speak unwholesome words. Don't give human viewpoint opinions and ideas. This is all the way from criticizing people, judging people. All of that is unwholesome words, by the way. And then, of course, he gives us a big don't under number nine. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. By whom what? You have been sealed for the day of redemption. Now, grieving the Holy Spirit occurs through personal sin. This is why he's got all up here. Uh, you know, lay aside the falsehood. Uh, don't sin. Don't, don't let your uh, righteous indignation come over into something that will be uh, emotionally involved in sin. Don't become involved in paragismas. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Don't steal. Don't speak those own un, uh, unwholesome words. Because these things grieve 
the Holy Spirit. That is, they get you out of fellowship. And they quench the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. Personal sin, once you commit a sin, grieves the Holy Spirit in the sense that now he is not in control. Now you have taken over through the function of your volition and your old sin nature, you've taken over control of your life. Putting yourself in a vulnerable position to be influenced through Satan. Through Satan taking advantage of the opportunity that he has. Through his doctrine of demons, the false doctrine that attacks the person and integrity of our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Putting you in a position of being under the deceitful spirits, that is, the deceitful influences of human rationale. Now you're in that position. That's what grieves the Holy Spirit and quenches his ministry. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, you've got the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. Uh, you've been, you have received him as a guarantee, as a down payment. Uh, you have been uh, sealed by means of his sealing ministry. Uh, once saved, you're always saved. You've been signed and sealed. Signed, by the way, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You've been signed, sealed, and sealed now by the ministry, or the presence, I should say, of God the Holy Spirit, and delivered. You delivered at the right hand of God the Father through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can write your name and put sign, signed, sealed, and delivered. That's you. Nothing can ever change that. However, by grieving the Holy Spirit, you can bring the plan of God to a screeching halt in your life. But you're still signed, sealed, and delivered by God. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You have been sealed by means of the ministry of God the Holy Spirit and delivered to God the Father in the person of Jesus Christ. So we have a lot to be rejoicing over. But don't grieve the Holy Spirit, whereby you have been sealed until the day of redemption. Do put away that old sin nature activity in verse 31. Let all of the bitterness and the wrath and the anger and the clamor and the slander be put away from you along with all malice, the desire to hurt people or get back at people, even to the point of murder. See, we've already learned in our passage, haven't we? You've got the ability, you have received the power from God to lay all of that aside. What did he say? In one sweep, in one swoop of his hand, what did he say? Lay aside the old man. So now he comes back and gets a little more specific, just in case someone didn't get the message. The bitterness that you have towards someone, the wrath that you've allowed to build up in your life because of the way you were treated, or what someone said to you, or what they did to you. And it is just seething in there, and the grudge is there, and the wrath begins to boil up. Thumas, uh, Paul deals with it in this passage, by the way. Or in Ephesians, I should say. He deals with it, and deals with it in this passage. The concept of the wrath swelling up in you, and of course, gain, gaining control emotionally. The anger and the clamor, the slander. That's, that's where you, of course, slander other people. Uh, you uh, judge them, criticize them. You defame them in front of other people. You gossip, etc. You know, he's really, a, he's really a pretty good guy, but, but, but. Slander. Let these things be put away from you, he says, with all malice. And then the final. Do, the positive we wind up on. Do become kind. Do become sensitive. Do forgive. Do become forgiving. These are the positive notes. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, that's being sensitive to the needs of those around you. Just a, and forgiving. Unconditional forgiveness. Un forge unconditional forgiveness. Because we know it says, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. The un Conditional forgiveness. So do become kind. 
do become uh, sensitive uh, to those around you and, of course, do become involved in unconditional forgiveness. All right, so remember, these present the dynamics of the renewed mind, operating under three principles that they had been taught. Again, these represent, these 11 imperatives represent the dynamics of the renewed mind operating under three principles that they had already been taught or that he taught them in this passage. I call them the three coulda, shouldas. They could and they should. Put off the old man. So here's the challenge for us. We can and we should put off the old man. We should operate under the filling of the Holy Spirit. We should make sure that we do not grieve the Holy Spirit. We should make sure that we do not quench his mentorship ministry in our life. So they had, first of all, the, fu the first coulda, shouldas. They could and should put off that old man. They have received the victory. They've received the power, the ability to lay him aside. The Lord Jesus Christ gave us a victory over the old man. The power of the old sin nature has been stripped away if we will utilize the power that God has given to us through the ministry of God the Holy Spirit as the agent of God's power. Utilizing, of course, the Word of God as the source of that power in our life. The inhale and the exhale of doctrine. The breathing of our minds. That's number two. They could and they should be constantly renewed by the breathing of their minds. They could and should be constantly renewed by the breathing of their minds by the inhale and the exhale of the Word of God. Believers in Jesus Christ who are not taking in the Word of God on a consistent basis are kidding themselves. They're giving so much opportunity for Satan, giving him an opportunity to take advantage of every situation in which they find themselves. Be careful. The inhale and the exhale of the Word of God. Now, the third coulda, shouldas, they could and should be putting on the new man. That is, walking in the Spirit, walking by means of the Spirit, living within the confines of the unique spiritual life that God has given to us. The unique spiritual life of the church age, given first to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then given to us. So they could and should be putting on the new and unique spiritual life that reflects what? The thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the new life does. This is what the new man does. He reflects the thinking of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We have that mind of Christ, Paul says. It's in the teachings of the Word of God. And so we, of course, have a completed canon of Scripture. So we are to operate under the two power options of God the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. All right, so they could and should put off that old man and operate under the filling ministry of God the Holy Spirit. They could and should be constantly renewed by the breathing of their minds, the inhale and the exhale of the Word of God. They could and they should be putting on the new and unique spiritual life that reflects the thinking of our Lord Jesus himself operating under the power of God, that is, the two power options. This is what our Lord Jesus Christ did, as so indicated in Luke chapter 4, as we've studied so many times, verses 1 through 14. He operated under the filling of the Spirit. He operated under the mentorship ministry of the Holy Spirit. His inhale and exhale of doctrine was very apparent in his use of the Word of God. And he returned in the power of of the Spirit of God. He operated within the realm of God's power under the ministry of the Holy Spirit 
and the ministry of the Word of God. All right, the believer must not try to live this new spiritual life within the confines of the old human viewpoint, way of thinking. That was back in Matthew 9, 17, where our Lord gave uh, this illustration of when you take new wine and put it in old wineskins, then the old wineskins burst because the new wine fermenting just a little bit will expand and will explode and will destroy the uh, old wineskins. And so therefore what happened? You lose the wineskins and you lose the wine both. And so you get nothing out of it. And so therefore, the concept of the new wine in the new wineskins. You cannot try to live the new spiritual life within the confines of that old human viewpoint, the Mataiotes mind. Either it is the mind of vanity or it is the mind that has been renewed. The thinking of the church age believer must take on the thinking of Jesus Christ. That's what God expects. He doesn't expect you to come up with this on your own. He doesn't expect you to do He's already given us what we need. He's given us the thinking of Christ. He get, he's given us the means by which the spiritual life can be lived. He's given us God the Holy Spirit to be resident on the inside. He's given us His infallible Word that God the Holy Spirit can use. So therefore, <laughs> we shouldn't be trying to live the new spiritual life within the confines of the old way of our thinking. Those old wagon wheel tracks, those ruts, the old ruts in our mind. We need to make new wagon wheel tracks. The thinking of the church age believer taking on the thinking of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this renewed mind is presented in the Word of God as centering around two things. Number one, new being different and new being recent. The renewed mind centers around information that is new different and new recent. With just the Old Testament, you do not have the thinking of Christ. Now you have the Word of God, and you have part of God's thinking and Christ's thinking as Creator, etc. But you don't have the full meaning of the, of the mind of Christ without understanding the New Testament doctrine, the mystery doctrines of the church. All right, so Paul presents it like this. One in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and the other here in our passage in Ephesians 4 and verse 23. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul presents the idea of the renewing of our minds under new something being different. In other words, the Old Testament uh, doesn't have the same doctrinal content that the New Testament does. Because it's called a mystery. Information that had never been revealed before, never presented in the Old Testament, is now presented in the New Testament. <coughs> All right, so the renewed mind in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, sounds like this. Romans 12 and verse 2. <coughs> verse 2 of Romans 12 says, And do not be conformed. The Greek literally says, Stop being conformed. Because there, <coughs> there were those, <coughs> excuse me, in the audience who obviously were guilty of this. Stop being conformed to this world. Now the word world there is really not world. The word is ion, age. Stop being conformed to this age. But rather, he says, be transformed. There must be a metamorphosis that takes place. A metamorphosis 
By what? By the renewing of your mind. All right, if you're not going to be conformed to the age, and if you're not going to, then if you're not going to be controlled and uh, conformed, taking the pattern of the age in which you live, then there's going to have to be a metamorphosis. There's going to have to be a renovation by the renewing of your mind. Now, the word renewing is our word on the screen, anachinosis. And then he goes on, by the renewing of your mind, that, in, in order that, you may prove what the will of God is. Namely, that it is good and acceptable and perfect. Principle. Without the renewing of your mind, you'll never know what the will of God is. You'll never understand the will of God. Without the renovation and the renewing of your mind by means of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, learning to think the mind and have the mind of Christ, you'll never understand what the will of God is. And that's what he says. Stop being conformed to this world or this age, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind, your noose, Hina, in order that you may prove what the, will of the, what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. Three dynamics of the will of God, which we will not digress and study at this point. All right, so now, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, that you be renewed, and this time it's ana neuo. First, there's anakinosis, A-N-A-K-A-I-N-O-S-I-S, anakinosis. And then there's ananeuo, A-N-A-N-E-O-O. Now, you can see on the screen, I've tried to block that out to make it, or put blocks around it and hopefully simplify it a little bit. Anakinosis, from Romans 12, 2, emphasizes the difference or the content of the mystery doctrine of the church relative to the unique spiritual life of the church age believer. Why do we need it? Because the unique spiritual life of the church age did not exist in the Old Testament. So therefore we have to have information that is new, information that is different than what we had in the Old Testament. We've made many comparisons with reference to this whether we're talking about the law of Moses and the fulfillment of the law of Moses through our Lord Jesus Christ, whether we're talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and his endowment ministry in the Old Testament compared with his filling ministry and indwelling ministry in the New Testament. Whichever doctrine you want to take, or whichever avenue you want to go on, you can find so many of them. Doctrines in the New Testament that were not revealed in the Old Testament. And so therefore, Romans 12, 2 uses the word anachinosis, emphasizing the difference, the fact that the protocol plan of God based upon the life of Christ is different from the ritual plan of God based upon the Levitical offerings and the, Levit and the, the concept of the altar in the Old Testament. There's a lot of difference. And so this is why Paul uses in this passage the concept of anachinosis, new, different, the content of the mystery doctrines of the church. Information never before revealed in the Old Testament. Then in Ephesians 4.23, Ananeuo emphasizes the, rec the recent concept, the recent re uh, revelation, thank you, recent revelation relative to the unique spiritual life. Got too many R's wrapped, wrapped my tongue around my eye teeth and I can't see what I'm saying. All right, so Ephesians 4.23 with Ana Neuo emphasizes the recent aspect of the uh, revelation that, that was given that is relevant to the unique spiritual life of the church age believer. Information, of course, not given in the Old Testament. So the believer's mind is to be renewed or renovated, changed by means of the two power options of the spiritual life. 
Again, God, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. All right, we've already seen aspects of the Mataotes mind. Next, coming up, we're going to see some concepts and principles related to the renewed mind. And so I have about 10 results of the renewed mind, which I will not be able to get through at this point since I'm already out of time. So we'll pick up next time with the 10 results of this renovated mind that God has for us. All right, let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity we've had to study these things together. What a challenge your word has given to us today to make sure that we are faithful and consistent in taking in your word so that God, the Holy Spirit, can do his supernatural work so he can give us that renovated mind, so he can make that metamorphosis that must take place in our thinking and in our lives, so that our, the thinking of our Lord Jesus Christ and the mind of Christ can be in us. And we can use that under the ministry of the Holy Spirit to honor and to glorify our Savior. So we pray that God the Holy Spirit will challenge us with these things so that we might be able to accomplish this and make an impact for our Savior. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen.